So as you're talking about the bigness of God, one of the things that we've talked about is patience. One of the first characteristics of, of God's bigness is that he's patient. That's how you get big, is patience. And then um, we talked about it as a sign of maturity. And then uh, the next week we talked about yeah, we talked about the love of God. So as we're, we're talking about the bigness of God, we talk about his love, we talk about his patience, which is the first characteristic of, of love. Today, we're going to talk about escaping certain death. Because if something is big, when it stops being, when it stops growing, even if it's just humongous, but then it's not growing anymore, it, 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 yeah, it's so big, but it's but the reason it's not growing anymore. Something ceased to happen. And it remained either the same or it shrunk or whatever. And so because God is eternal, his bigness is not quantifiable. It it there you can't say God is that big because he's always bigger than that big. That may have been big, but he's still bigger. And so Anything in the universe that causes big to cease or causes um, growth to stop, we need to look at because that's what's going to limit our bigness, our God's bigness. And so the first thing that I can see that would try to put a cap or a limit on the bigness of God not, that, not on him, but on his creation and on us, is death. The Bible tells us that the wages of sin is death. Sin is the reason that we aren't already in eternity in the garden, in la-la land, 24-7 on every level. Sin is the reason. And the Bible says that when sin is waged out, or given its paycheck, the paycheck is death itself. And so I want to look at death and how to escape certain death while we're here on the earth and just lay that track down. Because as we go forth towards resurrections, uh, physical resurrections, we go forth towards um, spiritual resurrections, which is people getting born again, anything that is near death or has died, that, that was not God's will, we need an anointing to destroy its yoke. Because if you, if you think on these things long enough, you'll see that one of the subtle tactics of the enemy is to just sneak in, is to just, under your nose, without you even recognizing it, maybe we get a little slack about something, we get a little sloth about something. That's death creeping in. Maybe we, we pull back on our faith a little bit. That's death. Maybe we aren't witnessing like we used to. That's an expression of death. Maybe our finances are, are shrinking. That's death. Anything that's demotion is death. Anything that's coming that was elevated and is now coming down is death or an expression of it. And so if we're going to, when we're going to experience the bigness of God in all facets, in all areas of our life, we need an anointing to destroy it off of our lives and the lives of those that we're assigned to. We need to be able to be men and women of God that walk up on a situation, that walk up on a person, that walk up on a life and say, I've got your answer. I know that death is trying to creep in and I can run death off. I've got death, the skinny on death, if you will. See, I, I, I have found out some things about death that death did not want me to know, that you maybe don't know, but I can put my knowledge in action, call it faith, and run this thing off just by my presence being in here as a carrier of the presence of Almighty God. I mean, I can walk up and touch your checkbook and boom, break death off of it. I can walk up on your body and boom, break death off of it. And you think about all the things that, that, that lead to death. They are just simply an expression of death. 
sin. Somebody's in sin. Walk up on somebody bound by sin, lay hands on them, speak a word, declare over them, and break the chains of that sinful addiction off of their life. Uh, somebody's drinking, somebody's smoking, somebody's uh, doing something they shouldn't be doing, and it's got them bound. That's an expression of death, because if that behavior is left unchecked, it will result in death. So the idea is that when we can cut death off at the pass, we can take care of anything leading to death, if that makes sense. So we want to get over on the other side of death and work backwards with our anointing, rather than just trying to be people that can win people to Jesus through praying for the sick. That's good. That's great. But let's get over and be people who can resurrect folk from the dead. Let's get... You know, some, I, I've come across situations where people were like, uh, well, I've been diagnosed with this or this or this. But in the back of their mind, I know that if they had, the diagnosis had been worse, they maybe would have not had, they would not have gotten their healing. They would not have been able to receive. They just did just too much. But because it was a smaller version or a smaller form, okay, we're good. But why ever have that fear? Why ever have that reservation ever in your mind? What if they diagnose you with, you know, swamp fever or, or, or <laughs> you know, the kung fu, whatever disease they could come up with? Why ever be afraid? Because know that you've got authority over death. And if you've got authority over death, you've got authority over everything leading to death. And that's what we want to look in on this. Psalm 68 and 20 is where we're going to start this morning. And it's, this is from the Message Bible. Uh, this is the first one that we're going to look at. And it says, Blessed be the Lord. Day after day, He carries us along. He's our Savior, our God. Oh, yes. He's God for us. He's God who saves us. Lord God knows all deaths, ins and outs. That's Psalm 6820 from the Message Bible. I love that. The Lord knows all the ins and outs of death. I, I can't tell you how many times I've gone to pray for somebody or been in a situation, maybe it's a hospital or maybe it was, you know, in a home or something, and they're just staring death in the face. And they just don't know what they don't know. And if they knew what they didn't know, it'd be a whole different deal. It's amazing what, what knowledge does. I, I don't think it's a coincidence at all that Jesus said in Hosea 4 and 6, my people perish for a lack of knowing, a lack of knowledge. In the King James, Psalm 6820 says this, He that is our God is the God of salvation, and unto God the Lord belong the issues from death. This word issue is in the Hebrew a word that means boundaries. And it's uh, outgoing, border, a going out, extremity, end source, escape. Why was I so drawn to that verse in this study of vic overcoming or escape from certain death? It's this, this thought occurred to me. God did not originally put death in the earth. God didn't put death in the universe. If you go to Isaiah and you go to Ezekiel, Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28, you'll see that there was an archangel named Lucifer who was made all, just basically second in command in the universe, it seems like. And even that was not enough for him, that he had to go up over God, and he wanted to take out God. And the Bible says, be like God. And the Bible says when that took place, iniquity, was found in him. It was first found in Lucifer. So when 
Lucifer succumbs to iniquity. He perverts life and twists it into death through iniquity, through disobedience. So God sets parameters and boundaries so that this thing is not just running amok. And if you'll, and, and there's so much more we could say about God ruling over death. But suffice to say, let's go to the part that affects us. Genesis 6 and 3. And we're going to look at some of the boundaries, at some of the limits that death has, or some of the outline or borders, if you will, of death. Then also, I want to say this, simultaneously, the word issue, uh, the issues of death belong to God. It also means to cause to go or come out or to bring out or to lead out of or to deliver. So not only does he have his hand on the borders of death, he has his hand on the ways out of death. So if you look at Genesis 6 and 3, the scripture says, and then this is God talking to Noah. Noah gets off the ark. Mankind has just had to have a restart. Again, death had a boundary. Death had a limit because God said so. God said, I'm going to restart, but I'm going to save my man Noah because he's righteous before me. And so he tells Noah, my spirit will not always strive with man. Gosh, there's a message right there. The Spirit of God striving with man. What is God, is God having to strive with us during the day? Is God's Spirit saying without audible voice, but just a nudge, a leading, an impression, a thought, a desire, hey, don't do this, do that. Think on this, don't think on that. Be here, don't be there. And, and how often have we resisted that? How often have we said no to that? Hey, go walk up to this dead body and declare life to come into it. <gasps> what? <laughs> he says, my spirit will not always strive with man for that he also is flesh. Yet his day shall be 120 years. Now that's the parameter. God said about mankind, until Jesus returns, because he's not said anything else since then, that I'm going to number man's days at 120. Now, there's three reasons why a man would not live to be 120. I mean, we're talking about overcoming death. We're talking about walking up on a person that's less than 120 years and going, I have a right to pray that you come back to life. Or this one's big diagnosed with certain death. I have a right to believe that you will live and not die. And what right is that? Well, starting in Genesis 6 and 3, Scripture says God numbered man's days at 120. If you're looking at anything less than 120, you're looking at God's second best. Unless Jesus hasn't returned yet, and I've just given you the second reason a man wouldn't live to be 120. And that's if the Lord split the skies tonight and came back for each of us. Of course, we would not be living to one in 20. So that's, rule, that's reason number two. The first reason that man would not live to 120 is if he did not meet the conditions that God set down in his word. I mean, it's not just automatic that we live to 120. How is, why is it? Why is it that God says to Noah, I'm going to number his days at 120, and then the bulk of humanity doesn't live to 120. Why is that? I, I want to know. Inquiring minds want to know. Well, it's because he, he's got conditions in his word. And we're not going to look at all of them, but we're going to look at a few of them. And so if you know of someone that it, you're, you're trying to angle your argument, you're trying to angle in that moment of prayer, in that moment of counsel, in that season of of adjustment to God's word, and this is how God does things. And arm yourself with this information. Ed educate these folks. 
Because see, repentance can turn anything. So if a person hasn't been meeting the conditions and they happen upon death and you get this information to them, their repentance can be accepted and their life can be extended. You just look at Hezekiah. Hezekiah was pronounced, we'll look at him in a minute, but Hezekiah was pronounced with a debilitating life disease and he turned his face to the wall and reminded God of his life and reminded God of his deeds and, and basically was pleading for his life. And in that split second, right after I, the prophet had said, you're going to die, he repented. By the time he got out the castle, the word of the Lord came to him again and said, no, he'll live 15 more years. So we know there's a precedence for repentance turning death. We know it. Psalm 55, 23 says this. But thou, O God, shall bring them down into the pit of destruction. Bloody and deceitful men shall not live out half their days. But I will trust in you. I love how that's worded. It says because they're bloody and deceitful, they won't live out half their days. Notice it doesn't say half of God's days. I love that. I mean, think about that. You, we hate for people to steal from us, okay? But let's not be stealing from ourselves. Think about that. God said, I gave you 120 years. When I spoke it to Noah, I, I set up for every human on this earth an account. And in that account are 120 years. Now it's up to you to receive and to live out all those years. It, it, that's if you meet the conditions. This is rule number one, why somebody might not receive their 120. Well, we know this is true because God, uh, look at all the things, what all else God laid up for us in heaven that people don't receive. Just start with John 3, 16. Forget 120 years, let's talk about your eternity. For God so loved the world. That's male, female, young, old, walking with God, not walking with God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Well, so does just everybody get to go to heaven now? Well, there's many people. Uh, we mentioned this a few months ago. There's a well-known ministry that sent statistics not too long ago that says every single day it's estimated that 100,000 people die without Christ in the earth which means they split hell wide open. They died without Christ. 100,000 100, people. And yet, laid up for them in heaven in an account was salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. But they failed to act on the word and to meet the conditions to receive that provision. And they died without their rich spiritual inheritance. They died without it. Now, that's just unacceptable to me. And so we, you, to make an argument, well, I don't have 120 years, I just, you know, and then they're going to misquote some scriptures we'll talk about in a minute. No. God said, I've set it up in an account. And wicked, bloody, deceitful men, they won't receive half of their days. The word is their, T-H-E-I-R, their days. In other words, they were their days. They did not receive them. They did not leave them out, live them out. I love it. God is so good. He, I gave them. I gave them another half and they didn't live them out because they were bloody, wicked, and deceitful. What does bloody mean? It's to shed blood, anger, rage, violence. Deuteronomy 25, 15. I love this. This is one of my favorite messages in the whole world. First time I've ever gotten to preach it. Deuteronomy 25, 15. But thou shalt have a perfect and just weight. A perfect and just measure shalt thou have, that thy days may be lengthened in the land which the Lord thy God gives thee. So right here we can see that people, and this kind of goes in with deceitful, people who don't weigh things out, they have false dealings, slack dealings. Uh, somebody you know, says, well, they, they charge, they overcharge for stuff. They over, they over, 
overpromise and underdeliver. They deal with a slack hand. That lengthens a person's life. These are things that God looks at. And if we're guilty of these things, we need to repent because it's lengthening our days. Is it worth it to cheat somebody out of something? No, not when you look at it from what God's word says. I want my 120 should the Lord tarry. There's too much to do down here. Heaven ain't going anywhere. The work's down here. <laughs> down here is when you get one shot at it. Heaven repeats itself over and over and over, better and better and better, every day, every day, every day. You get one pass at earth in this form. 1 Kings 3.14 And if you will walk in my ways to keep my statutes and my commandments. You know, I, I want to back up a second here. You might come across somebody who's been diagnosed with a debilitating disease and these are this is their life. This is their past. And I mean, it's, it's the symptom is cancer. The symptom is a blood clot or a brain tumor or whatever it might be. That's the symptom. You're praying for a healing and God's looking at the heart. And God is all knowing. So he knows even if they get their healing, they're not going to change their way. So what God is asking us to do is to arm ourselves with information and not just go around laying hands on anything and everything without intelligence. The Bible says lay hands on no man suddenly. But walk up on situations armed with this information, and God may reveal by the spirit of seeing and knowing this person's bloody and deceitful. You need to minister to that as you minister healing. You need to talk to this person about their heart as you minister healing. Now, God knows whether they'll listen or not. So many times he'll drop healing on them as long with the condition, you know, with the thought that you're going to minister to their heart. You're going to get them under the word. You're going to, going to get them with the way they need to be going. And God can redeem and buy back. I don't want to say, well, until they decide not to be a bloody man that God won't heal them. I know that ain't true because I've seen God minister healing to some of the worst of the worst just because he's good. So we're not trying to box God in on this. But we are saying, look, let's arm ourselves with information to, to do just to be this super awesome resource of, of resurrection, of life-giving power, uh, of an effective minister, and let's minister to the root of things and not just the surface of things. It's one thing to get a healing. It's another thing to have a pure heart, to have a heart change, because that's ultimately what God's after. You can go to heaven with a sick body, but you can't go to heaven with a wrong heart, you know, a heart that's not received Jesus. And then you can go to heaven with a heart that's, that's not the way it needs to be, even though you've got Jesus in there, uh, because your heart, your spirit, and your soul, not just your spirit where Jesus lives, and, and lose out and miss out on rewards and miss out on things that God has for us. So we don't want that either. So Deuteronomy 25, 15, but you shall have a perfect and a just weight, a perfect and a just measure shall you have that thy days may be lengthened in the land which the Lord thy God gives thee. And this is talking about also honoring your word. You know, if you say one thing, do it. If you, it, you know, I like to under promise and over deliver to do more than what I say I'll do. That's what I, I do my very best to be along those lines. First Kings 3, 14. And if you will walk in my ways to keep my statutes and my commandments as thy father David did walk, then I will lengthen thy days. This is God talking to Solomon. In other words, there's no guarantee that I will lengthen your days unless you meet my conditions. And what was one of the conditions of lengthening Solomon's life? Walking in the way of God, walking in the word of God. How do you receive salvation? We talked about this a second ago. How is it that a person can die without Christ when Christ was provided for them? Ultimately, for whatever reason they didn't do it, either not knowing or rebelling or, or, or whatever, they did not believe in their heart. God raised Jesus from the dead. They did not confess with their mouth that Jesus is Lord. So you get from God everything the same way you get salvation. Everything from God comes in your life the same way. You believe the truth of it in your heart and you speak it with your mouth. 
And so when you fill your heart with these scriptures that lengthen your days, and then you're speaking it with your mouth, it's going to come out your mouth as you're storing it up in your heart. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Now you're speaking lengthening of life. Now you're declaring and now you're, you're claiming you're laying hold of your 120 years. You can't be doing that at having an, an unjust balance. You can't be doing that at being bloody and deceitful and wicked and violent. You can't, because your words are, 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 are death. You're just by default, you're not speaking life. You just can't do it living that way. But if you're speaking the word, you're not doing that, you're speaking life, your life is linked. I, I made a choice the other day, and I heard this in my heart. You just added to your life. You just lengthened your life right there. I made a choice. You just lengthened your life right there. I heard that loud as a bell in my heart. You just lengthened your life. That's good to know. Let's do some other things to lengthen my life. Praise God. Daniel chapter 4 and verse 27 says this. He's talking to Nebuchadnezzar, who's been lifted up in pride and whatnot. He says, Wherefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable unto you and break off your sins by righteousness. That word righteousness is right standing with God or standing right with God. And thine iniquities by showing mercy to the poor, if it may be a lengthening of thy tranquility. So God says, Breaking off your sin, you break off your sin, you judge yourself by acting right. And breaking off your iniquities by giving mercy to the poor, you may trigger a lengthening of your tranquility or a lengthening of your life or a lengthening of your, your position. So mercy and righteousness, mercy to the poor, That'll lengthen your life. And conversely, not doing those things will shorten it. What? I, I have a responsibility. My choices affect or, or don't affect whether I live long or short. No, it's all God. It's all sovereign. No, 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 no. <laughs> we're going to educate you on some things. So now when you walk up on dead bodies or you walk up on people dealing with certain death, you're empowered to an end that says well, you... We humans have a say in this thing. This is not just all sovereign God. I mean, that just there's nothing more frustrating than somebody who just makes everything the sovereignty of God. Well, the will of the Lord be done. Well, the Lord's going, well, what's your will? You have a will in this. You can lengthen or you can shorten. Now you choose. We're going to get to that in a minute. Psalm 91, 16 says this. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. I love this. So if your life is not satisfying yet and you've not seen salvation or you've not seen the salvations you'd like to see, you have a right to stand on this verse and say, yeah, I'll be sticking around. In the context of this whole chapter, he who dwells, <coughs> me. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High God shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. So the context of a life that's long and satisfying and, and set, a saving salvation type life, you know, you, you've seen Grandma passes and then everybody gets born again. And they, oh, God answered grandma's prayers. Well, I, I, I want my prayers answered before I go to heaven. <laughs> I want to see it with my eyes. And, uh, but the context is, is dwelling in the secret place. The world knows nothing about the secret place. They have no concept of the secret place of the most high God. That's why they run around uh, like chickens with their heads cut off and frayed hairs. Uh, because they know nothing about a secret place that, that comes from dwelling in the word and the spirit's presence of God. They have no idea. Uh, there's a lot of promises in that secret place that take place. And one of them is a long life. Uh, we should come back and look at all the promises in Psalm 91 for dwelling in that secret place. Uh, that'll lengthen your life. Maybe we should. Maybe we should. We, we've got just a second here. There's no need to rush. No need to be in a, 
a big, big hurry. Let's look at Psalm 91. Let's just read the whole thing. I mean, we're talking about escaping from certain death. Uh, this would be the chapter in the Bible to do it in. Give you just a second to turn to Psalm 91. He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Can you see that picture? You come up under the wing of God as you enter His Word and His Spirit, His presence. As they converge, now the shadow of the Almighty is over you. What does that mean? That There's another verse that I want to, before we go on, there's another verse I want to add here. Uh, I believe it's in Isaiah 51. Yeah, look, look at Isaiah 51, 16. Um, God is talking through Isaiah. And he says, I have put my words in your mouth. I love this. And covered you with the shadow of my hand. I who set the heavens in place, who laid the foundations of the earth, and who say to Zion, you are my people. The idea is that if you'll be about God's business, I don't care what it is. You may have a store to run. You may have an international ministry to do. You may have laundry and dishes and bills and deposits and praying and this and your own word time and the spirit of God say there's a church four hours away in what was the poorest county of America least populated county of America that's got a dead rat dead flies broken glass dirt boarded up a tornado ripped the roof off people sheep are scattered ministers died can't even see that the church is there from the road going to have to put a sign out front and then build two stories on. Go up there. Stay at a hotel where we're transitioning it into homes for human traffic survivors, mostly native, and get busy and get it done. And I will cover you with the shadow of my hand. Sometimes we preach to ourselves, don't we? I will cover you with the shadow of my hand. And no evil will befall you. No evil will touch you. I won't let them murmur. If they do, I'll silence it. I won't let the, the bills overwhelm. I, I, I will put it down. I'll send you a check in the mail from a Martian on the moon if I have to. I will take care of you. What I need you to do, what I really want you to do, what I'm testing your heart to see if I can trust you to do, is to break away from your way and, and, and yeah, it's for my kingdom. Yeah, it's for my glory, the story, the church, the bills. Yeah, all of that's for my kingdom. Yeah, no doubt. But, but we've got this. Now, this over here, put your hand to it. Touch that. Give me something to work with. Give me something to resurrect. Give me seed. And see if I don't have a special harvest waiting for you and for all of it. And I'll cover you with the shadow of my hand. Because for you, that is my secret place right now. That is you dwelling in my secret place right now. Now, will you obey? And will you obey willingly? And I'll handle everything that concerns you, that concerns me. Now, that's, I, I have these verses. I drive out on these verses. I turn the key on these verses. They either work or they don't. And if they don't, then there's no need to go in. But they work, and they are working. And so you have to, so when we say escape from certain death, 
I mean, how deep do you want to go? That's really the question. How, how uh, radical do you want to be? And so what we're saying today is you may be in the midst of the busiest season of your life and the Holy Ghost say, hey, come, come, come over here. Come do this. Come. I'll refresh you in the moment, in the doing. And then I'll put you back where you need to be. Or you think you need to be. Yeah. That's God. That's Psalm 91, 1. Isaiah 51, 16. Some of my favorite verses in the whole Bible. We're talking about escaping from certain death. Death can't touch you in the shadow of the, of the Almighty. Can't touch you. Death and God can't coexist. They're not partners. They're not in cahoots. They are at violent war with one another. Well, they were. <laughs> that battle lasted about the flash of a lightning flash. And Jesus won. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge. So you got to say something. You got to dwell. You got to put his, what, what is dwelling in the secret place? What is the, of the most high? Well, look at the context of Isaiah 51, 16. I have put my words in your mouth. If God's ever going to put his words in your mouth, where's he going to do it? In the secret place, because that's where his words are. Let, let's look at that in the context of Psalm 37 and 4. Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. And then John 15 and 7. If you remain in me or you abide in me and my words abide in you, you'll ask whatever you will and it'll be done for you. So there's tremendous benefits to abiding and dwelling in the secret place of the Most High as a means of escape from certain death. You may be facing certain death, but there's a shadow that you can get between you and death. So he says there's just a hair between them and death. Well, why don't you put a shadow between you and death? Start abiding in the secret place. Start abiding in the words of God. And you'll ask whatever you will. And if you want to go, go. If you want to stay, stay. But at least make it your choice. Don't leave it up to the devil and death. Don't give a choice. I don't know who I'm saying this to, but I'm saying this to somebody. Don't give the devil the choice that God gave you concerning your death or your life. And, and, and it's done by default. It's done by ignorance. It's done by a lack of knowledge. Don't empower the devil to choose for you. Don't empower sickness and disease to choose for you the choice that God gave you to make. Now, that's a word for somebody right there. That'll pull somebody up out of certain death. Just realizing, you know what? I have given the devil the right to choose for me. I will not allow the devil to speak for me. I will not allow the devil to choose for me. I will not allow anyone else, I don't care who it is, to make a choice for me that I was empowered to make for myself. I will not do it. I will not. Now the word I hear in my spirit is the word mate. I will not allow the devil to choose for me, my mate, when God gave me the right to choose who my mate would be as under the will of God, you know, God's favor, God's hand on my life. Now, whoever that is, now you take that. Don't default to the devil's choice. Don't empower him to the end that God empowered you and I. Now, that's what you do right there. Man, that's good stuff. Psalm 91, verse two. I will say, well, I think it just did. He is my refuge and my fortress. Well, if you say he's your refuge and you say he's your fortress, then what is he? Your refuge and your fortress. And the Bible says God is love and God is light. God is life. So if you're in the refuge of God, the fortress of God, you're in a fortress of light, life, and love. There's a message for you right there. Light, life, and love. The fortress, the refuge of light, life, and love. In him will I trust. Surely he shall deliver thee, or me, from the snare of the fowler and from the noise and pestilence. 
He shall cover thee with his feathers. Isn't that good to know? The feathers, that's the angels of God. He'll cover you with his angels. He's covering you with the shadow of the Almighty. He's covering you with the shadow of his hand. He's covering you with the wings of angels. And under his wings you shall trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flies by day. Sometimes when a person deals with sickness, it's those night terrors that tries to do them in. They can't sleep. They're up worrying and stressing and fretting over this and over that. Nor for the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor for the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy side and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come near thee. This is painting a picture that you have a right to claim what no one else around you is potentially claiming. Your enemies are the 10,000 at your right. The 1,000 at your left is those fighting with you. So it's possible that 1,000 Christians in your presence are not claiming Psalm 91, but you could. And God would honor it. God, God's not a communist. You know, he's not lumping everyone together. And y'all, one sin, y'all pay for it. He's not, he's not like that. Now, your sin may affect many people, but it's not because of God. In the New Testament, each man dies for his own sins. Not the fathers, not the this. That's why I don't believe in generational curses. I just believe stuff like that's familiar spirits. The familiar spirits that got familiar with weaknesses in families, and they just hit those same spots generation after generation. I don't, the Bible's clear in Galatians 3.13, you've been redeemed from the curse. There's only one curse, and it's in Deuteronomy 28, verses 14 and following all the way to the end of the chapter. Jesus either redeemed you from all curses or he didn't. Now, you may step back under the curse, but that's your, I'm, that's your choice. I don't, I'm not going to do that. So then he says, um, only with your eyes shall you behold and see the reward of the wicked, because you have made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the most high, thy habitation. Sounds a lot like Psalm 37 and 4 and John 15 and 7 abiding and dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over you. Death is an angel. Well, we can take charge over that angel. Run him off. Matter of fact, Romans 8 and 2 says, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. He says, um, they'll bear you up They'll keep you in all your ways. They'll bear you up in their hands, lest you dash your foot against the stone. You'll tread upon the lion and the adder, the young lion and the dragon you'll trample under your feet, because you have set your love upon the Lord. Therefore, I will deliver you. I will set you on high, because you have known my name. You will call upon me, and I will answer you. I will be with you in trouble. I will deliver you, and I will honor you. With long life will I satisfy you and show you my salvation. Now that's Psalm 91. That's a real good place to, to meditate in, escaping certain death. Let's jump back over here and uh, look at Exodus 23, verses 25 and 26. You shall serve the Lord your God, and he shall bless your bread and your water. I will take sickness away from the midst of you. There shall nothing cast their young nor be barren in thy land. The number of thy days I will fulfill. We're going to break right here for just a second.